In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Back in the 1930s, my mother was in a girls' boarding school, not indeed known, uh, not in fact unknown to our director of music. And even 60 years ago, after she was leaving, she couldn't help but recall with horror the pudding that was served every Friday evening. The remains of every pudding from the previous six days were combined, be that trifle, treacle tart, baked jam sponge, jelly, crumble, blancmange, and so on. All were mixed together and steamed in a sealed container for eight hours. The pudding that was then served was called resurrection pudding. I'm not sure if the name referred to the hope that even deceased desserts could rise again, or the fact that being edible was on the surface as unlikely as someone rising from the dead. Either way, it was obviously a triumph of economy over gastronomy, but for more than one reason, it came to my mind this week. At the heart of our readings today, it seems to me, is that we humans do not get what we deserve. As we read, read in the passage to the Corinthians, our faults are not going to be held against us. In the King James Version, not imputing our trespasses unto us. And the reception of the prodigal child in the gospel shows that God's loving compassion, forgiveness, and welcome is always going to trump the demands of justice and fairness. But if that is the direction of travel in God's economy of salvation, it would seem that the exact opposite still plays out in human affairs. In a society where the rich get richer and the poor poorer, very little is fair there. Some will agree that we don't always get the politicians nor the church leaders that we deserve, and the people of Ukraine are living in a situation that they did not and that they do not deserve either. Nowhere, therefore, would there seem to be fairness in the divine order of things that enables forgiveness, redemption, and salvation, as well as in the world where the lack of fairness enables injustice, inequality, and violence. The only thing that seems in common here is that rarely does anyone get what they deserve. But hold, maybe that is not the only connection. The phrase, also from St. Paul's, for he hath made him sin for us, has been much discussed and contested over the Christian centuries. And what I'm proposing now is not by any means of trying to give a definitive reading of that passage. But here it would seem to mean that Jesus and in his resurrection, we have the meeting point of those two trajectories, the two trajectories of unfairness, if you like. In Christ's passion and death, he did not get what he deserved. But in doing so, he enabled us and the whole human race, creation indeed too perhaps, also to not get what we deserved. In his case, that was unjust violence. In our case, it's redemption and salvation. The one leading to the other, the other necessitated by the one. Now, growing up, I had an older brother who was addicted to puns, and given my introduction, I've been trying to resist any mention of unjust and just desserts. But however unlikely and improbable, whatever the ingredients or the constituent parts, however against all the evidence and the experience, Christ's incarnation, death, and resurrection is always God's last word on the matter. And we have to believe to hope and to trust that in the affairs of this world and this life, that too will prevail. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.